my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place for women to come together to share their childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from women all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Britax Child Safety, Inc. For over 50 years, Britax has been focused on safety you can trust from the very first day. They welcome new moms and dads to parenthood with award-winning car seats and strollers for every lifestyle while providing extra confidence for the journey ahead. At the end of today's episode, I talk with Britax safety advocate, Sarah Tilton, all about making sure your car seat is installed correctly and how you can get your seat checked. You can learn more about Britax products and safety tips at us.britax.com. I also wanted to note that we actually recorded this before the COVID-19 pandemic. And since then, in light of most car seat checks being closed around the country, Britax is offering one-on-one virtual car seat checks with Sarah Tilton, who's been doing all of these really fun and informational Britax ads with me for the birth hour. She's their child passenger safety technician and certified instructor, as well as safety advocate. So you can actually go to a link that I'm going to put on the show notes and fill it out. And then you can sign up for a free service car seat check virtually. And she do, she does this for any brand of car seats. It doesn't have to be a Britax car seat. I just love working with them. And I'm so excited for this conversation at the end of today's episode. All right. Today's guest is Megan. Megan had planned for a hospital birth and she had always kind of wanted a home birth, but it wasn't really in the cards as far as health insurance and everything. But once COVID-19 um, broke out and she was going to find out that she maybe couldn't even have her partner there with her at her birth, she decided to switch to a home birth. So this is her home birth story. Hi, Megan. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Hey, Bryn. Thanks for having me. Can you tell listeners a little bit about you and your family before we hear your story? Yeah, totally. Um, So I'm Megan. I'm 23 years old from Astoria, Oregon. I currently live in Seaside, Oregon with my partner Cody and our two-month-old daughter Lila. I am a labor doula in training right now. Um, I'm hoping to kind of expand my knowledge on all things pregnancy, childbirth, and all of that, go back to school for that. So yeah, it's kind of me. <laughs> Very cool. I'm so jealous. We used to live on the Oregon coast, and this is like the time of year we're usually visiting, but we can't this yeah, year. So I know <laughs> it's a lot less busy. That's for sure. I bet. I bet. All right. Yeah. So let's start with finding out you were pregnant, and then how your pregnancy went. Okay. So I became pregnant in September of 2019. It was not planned. We were definitely surprised. I had actually gone through a miscarriage a couple of months before that. So um, we were a little bit shocked to get pregnant so soon afterwards. I kind of spent the first couple of weeks in disbelief and just kind of really scared of, you know, the same experience happening again. Um, Me and my boyfriend kept it on the down low. We, We really didn't share it with anybody for quite a long time, actually, just because um, I was, you know, not very hopeful of the situation until pretty much through part of my second trimester. It took me quite a long time to realize that this was finally happening. Um, So yeah, definitely just spent the first trimester taking it really easy, Um, you know, experiencing all the fun first trimester pregnancy symptoms. But sure enough, you know, our appointments just kept happening. We would make it to the next one and make it to the next one and finally kind of realized that we were for sure going to have this baby and started to be able to enjoy it a little bit more. I think we told our moms around like 15 weeks. We waited quite a long time to tell anybody Um, Our moms were both very excited, and I think I told my dad shortly after that. And then we had our anatomy scan around 17 weeks. Um, It was a little bit earlier than most. I'm not really sure why my midwife did that, but yeah, we had our anatomy scan 
around 17 weeks and we found out that we were having a little girl. Um, funny story, our the lady who was doing our ultrasound, she was like super unsure. I think with her decision and telling us that it was a girl, she kept kind of being like, well, I think it's a girl, but I would, you know, I wouldn't paint the walls pink. So we were kind of not really happy with <laughs> how she was telling us what we were having. She kept being pretty uncertain about it. And she kept just kind of telling us that we should wait you know, for the next appointment. So we did, we, we did end up telling people that it was a girl. Cause we, we looked, you know, we didn't see any boy parts. So we were searching, you know, on the ultrasound too. So we were pretty certain, but it, I mean, it was a little bit of an unsettling feeling. We had waited so long to find out the sex and then had our ultrasound tech, you know, not be super certain in her decision, but yeah, we were having a girl. So second trimester, was fairly easy for me. I didn't have terrible morning sickness my first trimester. Um, I think I only got sick a couple of times, but just kind of felt was nausea and, you know, being pretty fatigued. So I think that I was pretty lucky in that sense of not being super sick. I was also starting school around the time that I found out that I was pregnant. Um, I started to you know, go to be a labor doula. And I was having to commute up to Portland up at the time, which is a two hour drive. And so the drive would make me really nauseous, which kind of sucked, but it wasn't terrible. Um, so the tr second trimester was pretty nice. I got that energy back and, um, yeah, I think my boyfriend and I just started to enjoy it a lot more. We were, you know, certain that it was happening and so started to kind of have fun with it. And it was fairly our little secret for quite a long time too. We didn't tell people until about 20 weeks until we announced. And yeah, second trimester was a breeze. And then um, we were planning a hospital birth at the time. I had really wanted a home birth, um, but my insurance would not cover. Uh, so we were planning hospital until COVID hit. That's kind of when our plans changed. We were, you know, just kind of hearing all the horror stories of how certain hospitals were changing their regulations. And I was pretty up to date with the doula company that I work for. We were up to date constantly with um, our local hospital as to what was going on and, you know, who could be in the room and who could not be. And so um, at the time they, they were going kind of back and forth as to whether the father could be in the room. And this was around, I think, like 30 or 31 weeks of my pregnancy. So we were, you know, getting closer and I was starting to like panic. I did not want to give birth alone and not have Cody be a part of the experience. I had a doula at the time and I really obviously wanted her to be there. And so, yeah, I was not on board for that. So I think I just kind of had a freak out and called my mom one day and was just like, I, I'm not you know, giving birth in the hospital. Like I was researching free birth and not having doctors there at all and having a home birth without even a midwife at the time because, you know, money was kind of the issue before, you know, with the insurance not paying out. And so I was like, I'm going to have a free birth. I don't care. So I was researching free birth for a very short period of time. And my mom was kind of like, well, no, we obviously want to make sure that you have the care you need. So let's look at home birth midwives in your area. And if I, you know, kind of have to help you, I will, which was really nice of her. So we ended up finding our home birth midwife, Jennifer. I established care with her around 32 weeks and she started doing our home visits and at the time, we were living in a very small apartment in Astoria on the eighth floor. It, I don't really know what the square footage was, but it was tiny. Like you would have four people in the living room and it was very cramped. And we were planning a home birth there. So it was a little bit stressful. Um, plus, it was just kind of stressful, the thought of, you know, people that you know, just being around us, this was when COVID was really new. So I kind of thought if you were around anybody, like at all, you were just going to get COVID. So I was really nervous. But yeah, we were planning our home birth and I was really excited for it. Um, Cody and I started watching a lot of, you know, videos. We were planning to do water birth too. Um, started to 
educate ourselves on it and, um, yeah, get really prepared. And, um, one day my friend Alyssa called me and, um, told us about this house that was, you know, being rented out in Seaside. And she was just saying that it was really cheap and kind of in our budget and that we should check it out. She knew the landlord and I pretty much jumped out of bed and left within like 20 minutes to go check out this house because we had been wanting to move before we had a baby anyway, but just weren't having any luck, you know, with finding things in our budget. So I jumped out of bed and was in Seaside within like a half hour and looked at this house and it was really nice. And I pretty much, you know, we signed papers within like a week and everything and it was ours, which was really awesome. So this was around like, I think I was like 34 weeks pregnant. And so we didn't really have any help moving because we, I was really scared to be around people. Um, this was still when COVID was new and Cody and I pretty much moved our whole house. You know, he had one buddy come and help him with the furniture because I obviously couldn't do any heavy lifting and got settled and it was really nice. I was finally kind of able to nest in our old apartment we had a, it was only one bedroom. So our daughter would have been sharing a room with us. So I couldn't really, you know, we didn't have hardly anything. We had like a pack and play for her. We didn't have much like baby furniture. So I wasn't able to like fully nest. We were going to be sharing a closet with her. So to get a baby room was really exciting. And my mom ordered all of this baby furniture for us and we were able to put that together. And it just started to feel like everything was really coming together in the midst of, you know, all the scariness that was happening in the world. And um, yeah, I, I spent the last couple weeks of my pregnancy just enjoying kind of settling into a new home and, um, you know, just enjoying my big belly and enjoying kind of the early summertime and still obviously really nervous with everything COVID related. It was really scary. I was really worried that, you know, she would get it when she was a tiny newborn. Um, so kind of dealing with the anxiety of that, but just, you know, trying to stay really positive for everything. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much pregnancy, I think. All right. So um, how many weeks were you when you moved again? 34 okay. or 35. <laughs> so getting close. Yeah, pretty big yeah, belly. Yeah, big pregnant. Yeah. Yes, big pregnant. All right. And then let's talk about how labor started for you and how far along you were when that happened. Okay. So I went into labor at 39 weeks and one day, um, at my 39 week appointment, um, my midwives came over and I was telling them too, that I really didn't want to go over 40 weeks. I was feeling super done. I was, um, kind of suffering from the syphysis pubis. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but it's kind of where your pubic bone starts to stretch to prepare for labor. And this was really painful. I was like waddling around and kind of felt like I had been kicked in the groin and was just like so over it, um, kind of ready to have my baby. And so, um, I was talking about what kind of natural, induction things maybe I could do around 40 weeks if the baby wasn't coming, um, you know, doing castor oil and all the natural things. And my midwife had said that she really liked doing acupuncture better than castor oil. Um, and so we talked about doing that. And so um, my midwife has um, somebody who was training with her. She did acupuncture on me that day, actually, just more of a re relaxing round. It wasn't necessarily for um, inducing me, but she did do one pressure point that was kind of supposed to soften your, I guess, help soften your cervix. And um, I did end up going into labor that very next morning. So we're not really sure if that's what did it, if that was just like the final push that I needed. I had been losing parts of my mucus plug over the course of like a week or two before that. So we didn't know if that was that final push or if that was just the divine timing, but, um, I did go into labor that next day. 
Um, my mom was living in Tennessee at the time too, and she wanted to be there for the birth. She had actually flown in that night before, which was really awesome timing too. Um, and so, yeah, I just woke up pretty early. My boyfriend Cody was going to work and he goes to work early in the morning around like six. So I was up, um, and I could hear my mom up cause she's also a couple hours, uh, time difference ahead. So she was already up and I could hear her doing stuff around the house. So I just ended up getting up early and kind of spending time with my mom. And I just felt really different that morning. I felt extra tired. Um, I wasn't really having any contractions, but I was feeling a little bit crampy. I didn't think much of it. Um, and my mom and I were kind of trying to plan out our day a little bit. We were going to do some meal prepping and go to the store and do some things, run some errands. And I just kind of felt like I really couldn't do it. Like I really couldn't go and do very much that day, which was kind of odd. I really hadn't felt that tired where I didn't want to go do stuff. And so I had told my mom that I kind of wanted to go lay down again and maybe sleep for another hour or two before we left to do anything. And she was like, okay. And so I went and laid down for a while in the bed and was just not feeling good. I was feeling a little bit nauseous and kind of started to have what I thought was Braxton Hicks, which I had experienced before, but, um, didn't really think much of it. And they kind of started to come on the contractions a little bit stronger And so I got a contraction app out on my phone and just kind of started to time it. And of course, at this point, they weren't super regular because I was probably just in the beginning stages of labor, but I just felt different and I knew I felt different. And so I was kind of texting my friend about it and she's a mom. And so I was just kind of like, I, I think I actually might be in labor She's like, well, you should definitely tell your mom. So I got up and um, I told my mom that I thought I might be in, you know, early labor because I was just not feeling normal. And she was like, oh my gosh. And we ended up, um, she ended up not going to the store and she's like, well, you should text Cody to tell him to come home. So I did. And Cody was super excited and he was home within like an hour (laughs) of getting the text that I was in labor. Um, I didn't want to text my midwives and have it be like a false alarm either. I was kind of worried of doing that because my midwife um, lived about 40, 45 minutes away from me. And so I didn't want her, you know, to get all wound up about it. If it wasn't real, I would have felt bad about it. So I waited a while to tell my midwife. I just kind of wanted to see what the contractions were doing. And Over the course of the morning, they did get stronger um, and more consistent, and I knew that they were different from any of the Braxton Hicks that I had been experiencing. And so I ended up texting her and telling her that, you know, hey, I think that I might be in early labor. It's nothing to rush over. Um, I'm, you know, I'm doing fine. I have my mom and Cody and whatever. And so... She was like, all right, just keep me posted. And her assistant, Hilly, um, who was in training, was also going to be attending the birth. And then um, she had a partner who um, I saw for one visit, and she was going to be attending the birth kind of just for if um, baby needed attention and I needed attention. There was two certified trained midwives there, so she was going to let her, Patricia, know that was her name, that, you know, today was probably the day. And so, yeah, just spent the afternoon kind of, you know, hanging out. Um, Cody and I went for a walk around our neighborhood, kind of chilled. Cody got the birth tub set up for us and um, our water heater had actually broken that day. Um, We had been kind of experiencing it be weird for, um, a couple of weeks since we had lived there, but that day it just was like not putting out any hot water at all. So we had texted our landlord and she had sent somebody over to check it out and try to fix it. And he did something with it to where we were getting a little bit of hot water and, but not enough. And so 
yeah, we were, that was a little bit stressful once it kind of came time to fill up the tub. We were like pioneering it and boiling water on the stove. And so it took a really long time to fill up the birth tub. I didn't really labor in it until I was in active labor, which was the evening time. And my midwives came, ended up coming. I think I had texted them that, you know, I was ready for them to head over. I think it was around like six or seven at night. And my midwife, Hilly, the assistant, she brought over a birthing wall because I didn't have one. And so did a lot of bouncing on that. It was really chill, actually. It was really nice. We kind of just listened to music and everybody was kind of just talking and sharing stories. And I was just kind of, you know, in labor land in the corner or wherever, just bouncing on my labor ball and chiming in when I could and, you know, dealing with the contraction when they would come on. And yeah, it was nice. And then nighttime came and I know we, I can't really remember what time, but I know we went to bed really late. I think we were up pretty like in the early hours of the morning. Um, and my, you know, my midwives put me to bed and I was definitely not able to sleep at this point. Um, they didn't really do very many cervical checks on me. Um, they kind of like to, you know, have it hands off. And so I don't really know what I was dilated at this point. You know, I was experiencing really consistent contractions. Cody slept through the whole night. I really don't know how he did it, but he did. He, I would be like grabbing onto his arm sometimes so hard and dealing with the contraction and this boy was just sleeping through it. So he got a good night's rest and I slept when I could, which was maybe a couple of minutes at a time. I think I'd just be so tired. Finally, I know it was early morning, probably around like five or six, it was starting to get light out. I was just feeling so done because I had been in labor for, you know, 18 hours plus at this point almost. And so I was like just really wanting to know when I was going to have this baby and like what, you know, I was dilated to. So I had asked if my midwife would check me and she did. And, um, she wouldn't tell me the number and I, I don't, I think it was because she didn't want me to get, you know, discouraged, but she would just say like, well, I can still feel, you know, there's some cervix left and I can feel the bulging bags of water and, um, you know, let's just try to get you on the, the ball again and the labor ball and we'll, you know, try to work the rest of the cervix out. You know, we need to use gravity and all that. So I would get up and I would try to move around and I was feeling really exhausted at this point because I obviously didn't sleep good throughout the night. After a couple more hours, I was really ready for my waters to break and I was just like so upset as to why they would not break. I just didn't understand. I knew that I had to have been, you know, pretty progressed as far as, you know, dilation and everything. So it had just been so long. And so I had asked my midwife, you know, if she was able to break my water and she said that she would, if, you know, I really wanted her to, she really wanted things to happen naturally, obviously. Um, and so I think we waited a little bit longer, tried to labor some more, see if it would happen on its own. And sure enough, my waters just weren't breaking. So she did end up breaking my waters for me. This was, I think around like maybe nine in the morning or something like that. Um, it had been quite a while. Constractions really, really came on at this point. Once she broke my waters, they were just like back to back on top of each other. I was, you know, kind of, I was dealing with them. I was struggling though. I was feeling very ready to have this baby. I was mainly just so exhausted. It The pain was definitely hard, but I was just so tired. Like I could hardly just hold my body up. I'd be in the labor tub and I would just be like, I feel like leaning my whole body on the side. And I just was having such a hard time, like sitting up. I felt so tired. I would sit on the back of the, you know, facing back on the back of the toilet with a pillow and um, just lay my body down and deal with contractions. And that's kind of when I noticed that my body was bearing down a little bit as I was facing backwards on the toilet with a pillow. And I could just kind of feel like my body was just like pushing almost and that I wasn't really pushing. And so I told my mom that I thought that I was pushing and she was like, okay, well, we should get you off the toilet then for sure. And, um, 
I got into the tub and Cody was in the tub with me and I was kind of doing some squatting positions and I, I might have been pushing a little bit prematurely, but I had felt the urge, you know, sometimes. Um, and then funny, Cody, I think at some point just got too hot in the tub and he went and cooled off in the shower. And this was kind of at the point where I was like ready to push the baby out. And, um, I was like starting to feel like things were happening when I was pushing and I was ready to kind of sit back and he was going to be behind me. And I noticed that he was gone and I was like, where, where is Cody? Like it's time to have this baby. My mom was like, well, okay, let me go get him. So, um, he pretty much got out of the shower and directly back into the tub with me and yeah, I, he was, um, helping me hold my legs, which was not a position that I really necessarily wanted to give birth in, which was kind of having my legs up. I really wanted to kind of avoid the like typical hospital positions where you have to have your legs up. And I really either wanted to do a squatting or, um, kind of just leaned back against him with my legs down, but I was so tired that I kind of just needed that help. And so he ended up just holding my legs for me like that. Um, well, I pushed and yeah, I pushed for an hour and a half and we finally had our baby girl, Lila. Um, the cord was wrapped around her neck twice. So my midwife did have to go in and she spun her around a couple of times and then placed her on my chest. Um, and her cord was really short too. She only came to like the bottom of my boobs. She didn't even make it all the way up on my chest. Um, and, uh, we think that when, um, my midwife, you know, kind of placed her on my chest and was spinning her around that maybe the placenta had detached itself from the uterine wall and it caused a lot of bleeding for me. So, um, my contractions actually stopped at that point. Um, so I did have to have a shot of Pitocin to help deliver the placenta. And I did deliver the placenta in the bed. We had gotten out of the tub after a while. Um, and we kept Lila on her placenta for an hour before cutting the cord. Um, and Cody did cut the cord. Um, and we saved the placenta. We planted it with a tree in our front yard in front of, you know, the house that she was born in. So that was really special to do. Um, yeah, she was six pounds, 11 ounces and 21 inches or 19 inches long. Sorry. Um, and yeah, it was just a really great experience. Honestly, I'm really just happy with the way that it turned out. And even though it was long, it ended up being 26 hours of labor in total. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was just a really, really great experience. And I'm really happy to be able to, to have a home birth and have it be really intimate like that. Yeah. So how was like the first few days and then maybe a little bit longer term postpartum for you? The first few days were good. I was able to obviously just be at home and my midwives did all of her prenatals up into eight weeks at our house. And so she was able to just be seen at home. And so that was really nice. We um, really just en soaked up all the time and enjoyed it. I was definitely very anxious because of COVID. I was really nervous to have visitors um, I did have like my dad and my aunt Carrie came with, um, her daughter and my uncle, um, my mom was already there. So I think those are pretty much the first visitors that we had for quite a long time. I think our friends, Alyssa and Curtis came and saw the baby. Those are pretty much the only friends that we let see her, um, when she was that little, just because we had, they were kind of in our COVID circle. We were seeing them regularly when I was pregnant already. So it wasn't like we hadn't been around them. Um, but yeah, I was definitely very anxious just about her getting sick. Um, and so I didn't really want to go anywhere still to this day. She really hasn't been out in public. We have, I have never brought her to the grocery store or to a restaurant or anything. 
if we are around people, it's outside or it's people that we've regularly been around. So I definitely think that anxiety has been something that I've struggled with because of COVID. It's made it um, a lot harder, but I think that I'm doing pretty good as far as postpartum. She's very healthy and, you know, a happy baby and, you know, we're very fortunate for that. So yeah, it's been really good. Great. And um, were there any resources that you wanted to share? I can't think of any right now that I have, but um, I definitely want to link where you can find me if you want to be, you know, want to use a doula for our company is um, North Star Doula Service in Astoria. We have lots of cool doulas too to choose from on that site. And I work with a lot of great women. So yeah, shout out to them. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay, great. Well, yeah, send me the link to that and we'll put it on the show notes page. We will for sure. Right. Well, thank you so much for sharing today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been awesome. Now I'm going to chat with Sarah, Bertac safety advocate and car seat technician, all about making sure that your car seat is installed correctly. Hi, Sarah. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Well, thank you, Bren. I'm excited to be here to share some information with caregivers about, um, you know, how they can keep their little ones safe in the car. Yeah, I'm really excited about our chat today about car seat safety and making sure those seats are installed correctly. Can you tell my listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do? So I am a national child passenger safety technician and instructor. And so what that means is I will help families make sure that they have selected the right car seat for their child and that they have it installed in their vehicle correctly and that they're using it correctly um, to keep their child safe during during travel. And I might do that um, from public speaking at an event to a Facebook Live, a podcast here with you, or working something that is called a car seat check event or permanent checking station. Very cool. Yeah, I know that a lot of people are installing their car seats incorrectly out there because there's there is a little bit to it to figure out. So I love that there's professionals like yourself um, providing this service. So can you tell us a little bit about what someone could expect if they attended a car seat check event or made a one-on-one appointment with a CPST? Absolutely. So first and foremost, as a caregiver, I want you guys to go into this type of event with the understanding that we as technicians are educators. So when you leave our event, you should be empowered to be able to install that car seat and uninstall it whenever necessary. So at these types of events, what you should not see is the technician doing the work for you, okay? We want you, we need you as the caregiver to be involved. We're going to walk you through that installation. We're going to help you find the labels, use the user guide of your car seat, use the vehicle owner's manual of your vehicle to answer any questions that we might have about proper installation of your car seat in your vehicle. You want to make sure that technicians are using things like a checklist form, and this is documentation for us to make sure that we are documenting all of the information that you and I are discussing about proper installation of your car seat, and that we're reviewing the labels on the car seat regarding weight, Uh, accommodations of that car seat, height, and that your child fits within those guidelines. Um, I mentioned using the owner's manual of both the uh, vehicle and the child restraint. Uh, We should be checking a recall list to make sure that your car seat is not under any recall, and if it is, to help you understand what that is about and if you can continue to use that car seat um, until you can reach out to the car seat manufacturer. One thing many caregivers don't know is that car seats have expiration dates, so we're going to help you check that as well. Um, And 
discuss the next steps for your child, such as maybe they're riding rear facing. And often the question is, when can my child ride forward facing? So again, we're going to be the educator, but we're going to walk through all of those topics with you as the caregiver and use those documents, the checklist form, the recall list and user guide to help us help you make sure your little one is safe. I love that that's your focus, the education component, because, you know, I feel like in the past it was just install your car seat and drive up to a fire station and get it checked. And then what happens, you know, three months from now when you have to switch cars or something like that? Well, and that, and, and that I don't want to say that doesn't still happen, mm-hmm. but that shouldn't happen. Um, as a good technician, I should never see you at my car seat check again, because that means I've educated you and, and you're empowered to do that work yourself because every caregiver is very capable of doing it. Um, we, we get overwhelmed sometimes and there's a lot of things going on in our life, whether it's a new child or a second child, but we want to empower you to do that. Yeah. So uh, where's the best place for people to go to get their car seat insulation checked and to get this education? And then how do they know that the person helping them is certified to help them? You know, those are both great questions. And, you know, there's kind of this myth, if you will, um, and I think you mentioned it earlier, just go to the local fire station or police station and they will help you. Well, the unfortunate part is that both of those agencies are public service providers and, you know, they always want to help caregivers, help families um, stay safe. Um, but they may not be currently certified child passenger safety technicians. So you can visit a website, uh, Safe Kids. Dot org, And right at the top of the page in the header, you will see a couple of different options that you can select. And it's um, car seat checks and there is car seat inspection stations. And what's the difference between the two? A checkup event might be, I kind of think of it as like a pop-up event, right? Um, We might schedule a seat check at the local retail store on Saturday morning in their parking lot. And we're only going to be there on that Saturday morning. A car seat inspection station is typically a location that checks seats on a regular basis at that same location. So it could be a fire station or a police station or a health department, or we at Britex are a permanent um, car seat inspection station within our local county. Um, We do it on scheduled days. Some locations you can call and schedule an appointment at your convenience when they have an availability of a technician. So that's where you want to go. You can find locations by states, by areas at safekids.org. And how do I know that then the person I meet with is a currently certified technician? And you're going to know that simply by asking to see their certification. We as technicians and instructors all have something called a wallet card, and it will give you our name. It will give you our technician or our instructor ID number, and it will also give you a two-year range of dates because when we are certified, we are certified for a two-year period. And that time frame, the day that you're there should fall within the date range on that card. Don't be afraid to card your technician and don't be afraid to refuse their service or their assistance if they can't provide that for you. Um, You know, somebody could have been certified 10 years ago, let their certification expire, but think that they can still help. The unfortunate part is car seats are changing all the time, and they might have been a great technician 10 years ago, but not up to date with what's going on with car seats today. 
Thank you so much for all of those details. That's really helpful because I feel like it's such a a big wide world out there when it comes to this and we don't know exactly who to go to. So um, you already mentioned that uh, car seat technicians should be showing you how to install and not installing it for you. So that's something to expect at these events, regardless of what type of event it is, right? Yes, yes. Either one, um, we as a technician should function in the same manner. I just wanted you to understand the difference between the two titles of events right. because they can, you know, be a little bit different. Um, but yeah, regardless of of where I as a technician agree to meet you and help you or, you know, are at some type of event, I should always function in the same manner. Okay. All right. Well, a lot of my listeners are still pregnant and expecting, so they might have their car seat sitting in the nursery or something like that. When do you recommend that they get that installed? I would recommend that you know how to install it and how to use it. Um, I'm going to, I usually say somewhere between seven, seven and a half months, somewhere in that time frame. It doesn't mean you have to leave it in your car. Okay. Um, and often the, uh, the dad or other caregiver, um, is always going to be able to install it. And if I've done my job as a technician, I can show you how to install it. You will install it. And when you get home, you can put it back in the nursery until it's much closer to your delivery date and you want to have it in the vehicle. And I bring that up because car seats often need to be replaced after a motor vehicle crash, okay? So if we put our car seat in the vehicle and leave it in there too early and you're in a crash, unfortunately, but you don't want to have to replace that car seat that you haven't even gotten to use yet. So know how to do it, know how to use it, and then be ready to put it in just uh, prior to your um, expected delivery date. Yeah, that's a really good point. All right, well, thank you so much for covering this really important aspect of getting your car seat installed. Well, thank you, Bryn, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you so much again to Megan for sharing her birth story with us and to Sarah for chatting with me about car seat safety. If you want more information from today's episode, just head over to thebirthhour.com and search for Megan's name in the search bar and it'll pop right up. And don't forget, I'm going to be linking to that place where you can fill out a questionnaire in order to sign up for a virtual one-on-one car seat safety check with Sarah Tilton. I want to say a big thank you to all of our listener supporters via Patreon. These are the people that pledge $5 or more a month to support the birth hour. And in return, they get special perks like access to our private Facebook group, access to all of our archived episodes, which is over 300 additional birth stories not available to the public, as well as monthly bonus content and fun things coming up soon as we get closer and closer to our goal of 1,000 patrons. We have over 900 now, and I'm so excited to be able to hit that goal and then launch some new fun things for the rest of the year. I also want to let everybody know that our Know Your Options Childbirth course is still available over at thebirthhour.com slash course. Use the coupon code 100 off for $100 off your enrollment. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.